Good morning. If you'd like to open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2, we'll be staying here most of, most of our time. Matthew chapter 2. Whenever you think about the wise men, most of the time you think of the number three ahead of it. Uh, Looking at nativity scenes, you always see three wise men. Uh, But if you read God's word, you'll find that the number three is not there. Uh, But you will see three gifts that are given, and that's probably where the idea of three wise men comes from. But I was thinking today about things that have blessed my life that come in threes, and might have impacted yours and might have been something that uh, has caused you uh, something to, to remember. But there's a rule of three. And this rule is a principle that has, is taking place in writing. But it suggests that things that come in three are inherently funnier, more satisfying, and more effective than any other number. And so... You might think about that whenever you're putting a lesson together. Usually you see people have three uh, main points in their sermon. Uh, Martin Luther King usually had three main points in his lessons that he gave. Today I'm going to give you four though, so <laughs> I, can't, I can't say too much that might not be funny, might not be satisfying, uh, but I'm going to give you four anyways. So... But I I was looking at a list. I was doing Google searches and going through things. And things that come in three. Three little kittens, three blind mice, three little pigs, a three-ring circus, uh, three stooges. You might remember the Hanson brothers, the three amigos. Uh, There's also sayings that are out there. Up, up, and away, right? Ready, set, go. Uh, we have quite a few things that, we, we, that come in threes, uh, the three-legged race. Uh, you, ought, you might also think about tricycles. They come with three wheels, three-wheelers. I don't know what, why we had to lose those. I always enjoyed those as a, as a kid, riding around on those. Uh, strike one, strike two, you're out, right? Uh, so there's games even with three-pointers that make uh, great things. Uh, You also hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil, right? Uh, You might think of rock, rock, paper, scissors, right? The games that we played as kids. Uh, And as you get older, you think of things such as three-piece suits. Uh, You might think of the the strongest geometric shape is a triangle, right? Uh, But the one thing that affects us the most is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? And we were given that gift, uh, given the gift of our Savior coming to this earth and being able to see Him. One of, the, one of the other big blessings that I see, I was talking to Mike Vordenbaum yesterday and he was telling me all about his Christmas tree. He didn't know I was going to use this today, uh, but we'll bring him up anyways. Uh, one of the greatest blessings I've seen is that Christmas trees come in three pieces now. Do you remember as, when, maybe back when you were younger, uh, when I was younger, we had every piece of a Christmas tree that would come out every branch, and they would all have a different color on each and every single branch that was on there. And by the time that tree had been around for a year, by the time I was older, uh, we had had our tree forever, and so the pieces that were white looked brown, you know, and so the brown and the brown didn't, you know, you were trying to figure out this entire thing of how to go together. But one of the greatest blessings is that trees now go together in three pieces. What a great blessing that is, right? Uh, there's a lot of threes out there. Today we're going to look at, at some men who went on a journey, though, and they brought three gifts, three special gifts to give to a Savior that's on this earth. And I think about each and every single one of us is on a journey, aren't we? A journey of life, trying to figure out things. We're all searching for different things in our life. Last week, Barry talked to us about peace. Many of us search for peace, don't we? But the peace that Jesus has to offer is not of this world. And that's what Barry taught us last week. Today, we're going to be looking at the search for a king. The search for the king, right? And so let's take a look at Matthew chapter 2. And we'll see what it, what it takes to search for the king. Starting in verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, 
Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. This comes from Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out, found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the, the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. I think about these wise men. It's called Magi in, in, this, uh, in the NIV. In other versions, it, you'll see wise men. But this word Magi, uh, it uh, is also the word that we get today is magician. And so uh, we might see these men a little bit different today. But these were the men who were considered to be the scholars of the time. They were the wise men of their time. They were the ones that the kings looked to for wisdom, for guidance, and direction on things. One thing that is, is mentioned most of the time in, in most commentaries is, is that we don't know much about these men. We know that uh, the word magi is plural, but it doesn't tell us how many of them that there were. We have no idea how many of them came, but they came east in search of the king of the Jews. And from that statement, king of the Jews, it suggests that these men probably weren't Jews, but they were Gentiles. They were co probably coming from the area of Persia. And you look at this, it was after Jesus was born that they started this journey. And if you can imagine this journey taking place, it was, a, it was going to be a hard journey. It was probably going to take quite some time. We always see in nativity scenes the three wise men, right? But in this particular verse, when we read it, it talks about these men came to a house, not to a manger. And so we might need to take a different look at what, this actually, at what actually took place here. It took them probably quite some time actually to get to here. Some, some people have suggested up to two years for these men to have gone on this journey and actually gotten to this place. And so you take a look at this scripture and take a look at these men... And they were going to be on a very long journey. A, a journey that was difficult, a journey that was hard and not easy. Can you imagine what it would be like when they told the people, their companions, their friends, their family, or anyone else that they were around, we're going to go on a journey. We've seen a star. We've seen a star. And we're going we're gonna to head uh, west and go from the east over to this place where this star is at because... The king of the Jews has been born. Well, how long is it going to take you? I don't know. How, how, how long will it take you to, to... What will you have to, to take with you to do this? I don't know. How long will it take you to get there? Not sure of that either. You might think, boy, for wise men, uh, you really don't know very much, do you, for this journey? And I, I think about this situation and what these men must have gone through to get to see the king of the Jews. It had to have taken faith, wouldn't it? I don't know how they realized that this was the star 
of Jesus Christ, that this was the star of the Messiah. It tells us in verse 2 when we read this, that this, that we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. They saw his star. They knew that was his. How did they know that? It doesn't tell us. And so it would have taken a great deal of faith to step out and to take this journey. Men and women of the Bible have to take steps of faith, don't they? You think about Abraham and his journey. Pack up everything and I want you to head where, where I tell you to go. What's he do? He packs up everything. Could you imagine the questions that were asked of him? Could you imagine what the other people that went with him asked? Where are we going? Not sure. What will we do when we get there? Not sure of that either. But we're going to go where God tells us to go. And so I look at this and I, I look at a wise man's journey. A wise man's journey is one of faith. It requires us to have faith in God and to do the things that he's called us to do and to know that no matter what happens, that things will work out for the betterment of him if we do it his way. And so a wise man's journey consists of, of a journey of faith. Question is, are we on a journey of faith? When you make decisions each and every day, do you make them based upon the decision, is this better for God or is this better for me? Do we even put God in the picture? Do we even think about Him? Are you making decisions as a wise man? In Hebrews 11, verse 6, it says this, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. It's impossible to please him without faith. It will take faith for us to go on that journey and to, and to find him. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 also tells us, For we walk by faith and not by sight. As Christians, we must continue this journey of faith, of taking steps and looking for him and trying to find him. But we go back and we also look at this. And as they traveled... They came to, to Jerusalem, and it was there that they came to King Herod, right? And they asked him, where can we find the king of the Jews? Where can we find him? Where is he at? It's not always easy to ask questions, is it? Sometimes we're scared to ask the question, where, he, where is he? Where can I find him? But I like the idea of what they look to to find Jesus. They might not be searching for Jesus, but they pointed out in God's word that he came from Bethlehem, right? That he is to be born in Bethlehem. And so as I look at this, a wise man's journey is one guided by the word. We must be guided by the word in everything that we do and everything that we look at. We must be looking towards his word in order to find him, in order to search him out. It's only done through the word. I think about Psalm 119, 97, verse 97. It says this, Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path, so that I might obey your word. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than the honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts. Therefore, I hate every wrong path. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. We sing that song quite often, right? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I think about a wise man's journey must consist of looking to his word. In order to find him, in order to seek him, it must be that we are looking and being guided by his word day in and day out. We must rely on his word in order to find him. As we go on, we look at verses 9 through 11. It, we see that they find out that he's in Bethlehem, and Herod wants them to come back and tell him when they find him. 
He'll be in Bethlehem. Go and find him. Come back and tell me so that I can worship him too. Not exactly what Herod was, was wanting. He lies to them at this point, but sends them on this journey. They're about five miles away at this point when they, hit, when they finally make it to Jerusalem. And they go on this journey, and as they start out again, they see the star. And they begin following that star and heading towards Bethlehem. And it's there in verse uh, 10. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed on coming to the house. They saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. I think about when we finally find the Savior. When we come to that point, it'll bring us joy. And it will also, when we have the, the joy that we're supposed to have in meeting our Savior, it will guide us to worship Him. It will guide us to bow down before Him and, and have great joy. I think about 1 Peter 1, 8 through 9. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And even though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We should have joy on a continual basis. We, you think about Barry's lesson last week. He talked about us having peace on earth. There's so many hardships, so many things that we go through. But this is how we find joy. It's through Jesus Christ, our Savior, in knowing that one day we will be living in heaven with God our Father. And it's all about that. And we're going to have times of trials. We're going to have times, you think about this time of season, of being a time that is supposed to be of joy. But sometimes it's a time of hardship. Sometimes it's a time where, where we struggle and have lots of hardship. But there is a way still to find joy, even during those times. I think about this and it comes through us knowing that we have a Savior and being able to live with Him one day. Last point. <clears throat> a wise man's journey is one of change. It's one of change. You see in, in the very last verse that I read in verse 12. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. If you look at this for a second, these men were changed after this. They had to change even the physical pattern of the things that they were going to do. I'd like, I'd, I probably would like to think that these men were probably spiritually changed also through this experience of being able to go and worship and bow down before the Father. In our lives, the same thing's true. Each and every one of us is on a journey. We're on a journey of faith. A wise man's journey is one of faith. A wise man's journey is one that is guided by the word. A wise man's journey is one of joy and worship. But last of all, a wise man's journey is one of change. It requires each and every one of us to change. I think about Ephesians chapter 4 verse 22. It says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. When we start this journey and when we find Jesus, we won't return the same. It will require us to change our physical patterns, and it will require us to change our spiritual patterns also. The things that we do in this life, we will have to change every single thing. It won't happen in the blink of an eye. It won't happen all of a sudden. But it will require us giving our heart completely to God and changing. Today, I want to encourage you to continue on this journey. If you have been on it, I want to encourage you to continue on it. If you've not been on this journey, if you've not been seeking this out, maybe you've not looked at God's word. Maybe you've not had the time to, to search out his scriptures. We're here. 
we'd be glad to sit down and study with you and talk to you about that. I think about one last thing, though, also. Maybe you've been on this journey, and you know where it leads, and you know what happens when you find it, and you've got this joy. This joy should cause you to want to share it with every person around you, right? This time of season, many people come to church. Many people are seeking things out and looking for just to hear this story. We can share that story with others, right? We can be that star that leads these wise men to Jesus. In Philippians chapter 4, or chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, it says this. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. As you hold out the word of life. We can be just like that star, the star of Jesus that leads people to him, that will give them joy and that will cause them to worship him question is, have we found that joy? That joy where we will share that with everyone else. That's what it's all about this season. That's what it's all about, is sharing Jesus with everyone and letting them know about our Savior. This morning, maybe you're on this journey. Maybe you're searching for Him. We want to give you uh, the time. Maybe you need prayers. Maybe you uh, would like to come forward and and ask for help. Maybe you don't want to walk up to the front and maybe you just want to ask questions. We're here for you for that too. And so find us after church. Come and talk to us uh, this morning. Remember what Jesus did. Remember what he's done for you. What a blessing it is that he came to this earth. That he was born the way that he was born, the way that he was. He fulfilled all those prophecies and then he laid down his life for us so that we could live with him one day. This morning, if you need anything, we ask that you come now as we stand and sing.